is the second edition. Um, as you may be aware, um, last month, um, June, um, our team here at Africa CDC um, started to host what we call our monthly One Health and COVID webinar series. Um, really to focus on the key activities and the opportunities for One Health um, in responding to COVID-19 across the continent and globally. Last month, we had a fantastic session looking at, um, um, looking at mostly the origin of the virus, understanding the virus. Um, we had participants and experts joining us from Echo Health Alliance, and we had people from um, a colleague from Bronx Zoo, New York City, and a genomic institution, research institution um, um, in Nigeria, from Nigeria, Redeemers University. It was quite an exciting session. Um, we are also expecting that this session is going to be fantastic because, again, as champions of One Health, we want to look at um, One Health-related COVID-19 preparedness and response efforts in Africa, and not, not to forget the impact that of COVID-19 on livelihoods and food security. Um, we'll, so we will be unpacking that um, during this webinar session. Um, during this webinar session, I have um, fantastic um, people from diverse um, fields of life, looking at um, people in research, looking at um, laboratory, and looking at um, FAO of, of the United Nations, and also my colleagues from Africa CDC. As you can see on the screen, um, we have put up the agenda. We will work with this agenda. So please feel free to start thinking around questions you might have for my experts who are on, on the call. I will be introducing them um, in a few um, seconds. So we will look at really the COVID-19 situation updates, the epidemiological updates across Africa. Our team has also worked at to um, map out lab laboratory capacity. Um, pat 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 Dr. Awande, we can't hear you.
just a second, I'm having challenges pulling up the slides. So here we go. I think we are ready. Um, fantastic. Um, so the floor is yours, Malion and Yuma. Hello. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I'm Marion Kangume from the Africa CDC Public Health Officer, and I'm going to take you to take you through the epidemiological situation and Africa activities as of 27th July, 2020. Next slide. Hi, Malion. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Colleagues online, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Yes, we can. Hi, Malion, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, so the floor is yours. You can start. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Good evening and good afternoon. I'm Marion Kangume from the Africa CDC, Public Health Officer, and I'm taking you through COVID-19 pandemic, the epidemiological situation as of today. 9 a.m. Next slide. Um, this slide shows the global epidemiological situation of COVID-19. And we have more than 15,000, more than 15.8 million confirmed cases, more than 600,000 deaths within 215 countries and territories with a case fertility rate of 4.1%. Okay. And this one is for the, the, the situation within Africa. Over 846,311 cases have been confirmed with 17,747 deaths. And the case fertility is 2.1. A half of those cases have recovered. We have the overall 13% increase in the cases as of today, with the southern part of the, re of the, of the, of, of the region showing the highest percentage increase. Next. And as of today, the new confirmed cases by 9 a.m., we have a total of 17,131 new confirmed cases with a case fertility rate of 2.1. And the Southern region is showing the highest number of cases that have been confirmed. And the Northern part of Africa, is showing the highest case fertility rate of 4.24. These are the Africa member states which are which have showed confirmed cases, and all of them, all the 55 African member states have confirmed COVID-19 cases with 37 countries having less than 5,000 cases and one country having more than 100,000 cases.
This is a snapshot of member states with the highest cumulative COVID-19 cases. About five, five countries have the highest number of confirmed COVID-19 cases, with South Africa showing the highest number of cases that have been confirmed. And the case fertility rate, the highest case fertility rate is, Egypt shows the highest case fertility rate of the highest countries confirm, having highest number of cases confirmed. Next. The graph shows the trend of COVID-19 testing in the 55 African Union member states. As of today, more than 8.1 million tests have been conducted. And the test per case ratio is 10. The positivity rate, the overall positivity rate is 10.4%. Next. The graph of, this is a map of Africa showing the distribution of tests per case ratio of COVID-19 testing by country as of today, 27th July, 9 a.m. East African time. About 27 countries are show, <clears throat> have less than 10 per tests per case ratio, which is, and then 15 countries have 10 to 30 tests per case ratio. Three countries, and then three countries have more than 100 tests per case ratio. Next. The, num <clears throat> the table below shows the number of healthcare workers among the COVID-19 cases within Africa per region. As of, two, as of 26 July, a total number of 12,318 cases have been confirmed within the healthcare workers. And this has been confirmed within 48 countries out of the 55 member states of Africa. And the southern region shows the highest number of health care workers affected by COVID-19. And the northern region of Africa has no confirmed case among the health care workers. Next. Thank you, my colleague. We'll continue with the next slide. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening. Uh, I am Ilma Makonnen. I'm the FAO One Health Advisor, second to Africa CDC. My presentation will be brief. I will uh, give you a kind of a highlight of uh, the veterinary laboratories in Africa that were involved in COVID testing. Just a few examples from West and Eastern Africa. I'll also show you a few slides about the One Health, National One Health platform that were established in Africa and some of the major uh, achievements that they have accomplished over the past few years. Next slide, please. Uh, FAO has been mapping uh, African veterinary laboratories with the potential to provide support for COVID testing and also for laboratory sample storage, and some 26 countries uh, uh, have a list of veterinary laboratories with, uh, with potential of providing this type of support have been provided to Africa CDC. Nowadays, we don't have the full picture of which laboratories have been involved in COVID testing. Uh, the data is available with the Ministry of Health. We don't want to pressurize them at this particular time to, to provide this additional information, but through the FAO ECTAD units, uh, we have managed to get some information and I'm sharing that with you. Uh, for instance, in Ghana, three veterinary laboratories have been involved in COVID testing. The Accra Veterinary Laboratory, 
the Central Veterinary Laboratory in Pong Tamle, and the Toko, Tokorari Veterinary Laboratory. As of July 7, 2020, a total of 24,900 and over uh, this number have been tested. Uh, in Ethiopia, three veterinary laboratories under the Ministry of uh, Agriculture have been involved the National Animal Health Diagnostic and Investigation Laboratory is directly receiving sample from the Western Shoa province and uh, nearly uh, 11,500 uh, uh, samples have been tested by July 24th. Another veterinary laboratory involved is uh, uh, the Yabel Original Laboratory. This is uh, a laboratory located uh, near uh, bordering Kenya and usually dealing with the cross-border testing. Uh, in other words, people coming across the border and over 500 samples were tested as of July 24th. Another uh, uh, laboratory involved is the Animal Biotechnology Laboratory under the National Agricultural Biotechnology Research uh, located in Holota and over 500 COVID samples, COVID-19 samples were tested. The other uh, information I have received uh, is not directly related to COVID-19 sample testing, but uh, other related activity. For instance, Senegal, through the, the National One Health platforms, a lot of COVID-19 related activities have been performed, including uh, monitoring of activities of the EOCs uh, uh, related to resource mobilization and implementation of uh, COVID-19 response. Uh, they were also involved in monitoring the COVID health protocol for the Ministry of Education for the reopening of schools and other COVID-related activities under the National One Health Zoonotic Thematic Group. Uh, uh, Liberia and Sierra Leone are a bit peculiar in that these countries have got relatively weak uh, animal health and public health capacities. And FAO, uh, through the support from USAID, has provided a lot of uh, capacity development activities over the past five years. And uh, a number of training of local uh, personnel, anim community animal workers, surveillance and quarantine officers have been trained, laboratories have been established. And this capacity has now been put into good use and for instance, in joint contact tracing COVID-19. Uh, in Sierra Leone, similar activities have been also undertaken uh, in joint outbreak investigation and also through the National One Health Platform. Next slide, please. Yes, uh, this is not an exhaustive list, but uh, in countries where FAO ECTAR teams have been present, about 15 uh, or more than 15 uh, national one else platforms have been established. Uh, for instance, in Egypt, it is not called the national one else platform, but the four way linking has been properly functioning. In some countries, next slide, please. Next, yes. In most of these countries, the, one, the national one else platforms are formal and fully operational. In some cases, are uh, less operational, but not also formally recognized by the government. In many of these countries, the, one, the national one health platform has been established at sub-national levels, the extent of districts. These national platforms are organized in thematic working groups, like the Nautic Disease Thematic Working Group, AMR, Surveillance Laboratory Thematic Working Groups, etc. A major achievement includes in some cases, the development of one health policy. Uh, in some countries also, they have developed one health multi-sectoral action plans and a national action plan for health security. They have also developed strategies for the prevention and control of priority zoonotic disease and other public health threats like antimicrobial resistance. Uh, these national health platforms have been also involved in advocacy, particularly targeting policy decision makers and key stakeholders in trying to persuade them in to operationalize and also institutionalize uh, the One Health platform so that they can be sustainable. Uh, they hold periodic thematic working group meetings 
And these uh, meetings are usually for information sharing, like for instance, epidemiological situation updates, laboratory data, including sequence uh, information. They have coordinated some international uh, events, like celebration of, for instance, the World Rabies Day, International One Health Day, uh, Antimicrobial Resistance Awareness Week. They have organized also joint outbreak investigation, risk assessment, and some simulation exercise, like, for instance, in Tanzania, uh, regional uh, multi sectoral simulation exercise uh, for the response of Rift Valley fever. Next slide, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Mishak, over to you. Thank you very much, Wande. And good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to colleagues wherever you are listening. Uh, you may have missed the introduction because one day went off. My name is Mishek Mulumba. I work for the Agriculture Research Council at the Ondesteput Veterinary Campus here in South Africa. And uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, our experience in South Africa with regard to COVID-19. And we are going to see if there are any lessons which can be learned by the rest of our colleagues on the continent. So I'll start with just a, a few slides on the timelines. We first recorded our first case of coronavirus on the 5th of March. And uh, by the 23rd of March, the number of cases had jumped to 402. And this prompted the president to impose strict regulations and restrictions. That meant that uh, no one in the country was allowed to leave their homes. There was a curfew in place and the lockdown in effect had started. But by the 1st of May, the country had moved down to the highest level of lockdown, which was level five to level four. And by the 1st of June, we moved further down to level three with more sectors of the economy opening up. And there was also easing of some restrictions. And a week later, schools were allowed to reopen. But 100 days after the first case, we see that the number of cases in South Africa were almost 60,000, and we had recorded 1,284 deaths. Now, fast forward to last week, Friday, South Africa breached the 400,000 mark of cumulative cases. And uh, the epicenter of the outbreak moved from the Western Cape province to Hauteng province. And this really prompted the president to announce closure of all public schools and also a tightening of some of the meant under lockdown level three. But the point I want to make is that uh, the quick decisive action by government by imposing the lockdown when they did averted a collapse of the health system at a time when uh, little was known about how the disease would behave locally here in South Africa. But then what are the society's reaction to the imposition of COVID-19 cases? What did we anticipate and what did we actually observe? So essentially you can anticipate three things to happen. There will be that immediate reaction, which is followed by a lockdown fatigue and which is followed by basically some revolt of some kind when people get tired of all the restrictions. So in the first instance, there's fear, anxiety, people see people getting sick, people getting, I mean, dying. And then because of that, there was almost total compliance with all the government imposed measures during the lockdown. And then the lockdown fatigue set in. Then you had issues of economics, personal rights, unemployment and livelihood, all these arguments set in which wasn't unique to South Africa. We have seen it happening in other parts of the world. But the net effect was that we started getting reduced compliance with government imposed measures. And there was increasing pressure on the government to also do something about it. And the government decided that they were going to follow a risk adjusted strategy in terms of this pandemic, which resulted in easing of you know, some lockdown regulations. And because of that easing, we had a sort of rapprochement 
or some peace of some kind, where there was resumption of economic activity, then uh, the reopening of schools and some social activities were also relaxed a bit. The point to make here is that uh, if we have a continued compliance with all these regulations which have been set in place, then we are going to achieve a flattened curve and we are going to return to some form of normality. But life isn't so straightforward in most situations. And you still continue to get you know, some reduced level of compliance. Like in our case, we had uh, suddenly all the minibus drivers deciding that they were no longer going to observe the reduced capacity in their buses. They were going to go back to full capacity. This in the midst of you know, community transmission which was happening. And uh, with such situations, you can easily, you know, revert to a second wave if you had controlled the disease. Or in our case, we had a continuing epidemic. And the questions were, do you now go back to level four or level five of the lockdown or not? And uh, that is the sort of pressure that was on the government. And that is why the government announced on the uh, last week to say that schools are, public schools are going to close again. And then there was also you know, some measures being ramped up, even though we remain in level three. And what follows there is then people now openly, you know, going against the regulations. And we have seen this in other parts of the world where people are refusing to wear face masks, where people are also refusing to be on lockdown. Then that presents a challenge to several, I mean, to various governments, and they have to manage the situation so that uh, it doesn't get out of control. But let's talk about herd immunity, because most of our hopes are being pinned on herd immunity when a vaccine comes along that uh, when you get up to 75% of the population vaccinated, you are going to you not know, be able to stop the transmission of the SARS-CoV-2 virus in the population. Experiences, unfortunately, from other parts of the world have cast doubt on the ease with which we are going to uh, acquire herd immunity if ever we are going to do that. We don't yet know also what level of neutralizing antibodies are needed to fight off reinfection of uh, SARS-CoV-2, or at the very least to reduce the COVID-19 symptoms in a case of a second illness. But uh, fortunately, it's not only the antibodies which are involved in you know, fighting off the SARS-CoV-2 infection. We also have uh, T cells, which are important for the long-term immunity, and studies in other parts of the world suggest that uh, the T cells are already being called to arms in the cases of SARS-CoV-2 infections. But what is disturbing is that there is anecdotal evidence, even here in South Africa, of reinfections in recovered patients. So the questions to be asked then are, what does this mean for mass vaccinations as a strategy? Because that's what the world is spinning its hopes on. Are we going to need booster vaccinations? And if yes, at what intervals? Is it going to be practical if the intervals are too short? Or do we need to relook at uh, the antigenic diversity of what we are putting in into the vaccines which are under development? And in that measure, I would like to read you this quote from Ellen Ewen Callaway and our co-authors, which says, since we don't yet have a clear measurable marker in the body that correlates with long-term immunity, we must pierce together the patchwork of immune responses and then compare it with responses of infections with other viruses so that we are in a position to estimate how durable the protection we will get might be. Studies of other coronaviruses suggest that sterilizing immunity, which is a preferred one, which prevents infection, might last, unfortunately, for only a few weeks or months. But protective immunity, which can prevent or ease symptoms, could last longer. So what we are saying is one cannot get sterilizing immunity from vaccines, but from getting infected and recovering. And uh, this now in the midst of this anecdotal evidence where we get people who have you know, recovered getting reinfected. My colleague before me, Yuma, spoke about the need for One Health collaboration. This is a zoonotic disease we are dealing with, so it's important to adopt a One Health approach toward containing the pandemic. So this means that we need to mobilize all laboratory 
resources available on the continent in the countries in order for us to be able to test for COVID-19. Why is that important? Because the more testing you do, the more accurate your predictive model is going to be because you are simulating the actual situation on the ground. And uh, the ARC on the Staput campus in this regard has got very, very strong tradition of One Health collaboration with other actors inside the country, like the National Institute of Communicable Diseases and also universities in South Africa. For example, two years ago, we collaborated very strongly with the NICD to put down the listeriosis outbreak, which we had in the country. And we continue to collaborate on Rift Valley fever research and also, of course, on testing for COVID-19 through the National Health Laboratory Services. We are also looking at uh, research proposals, which we are collaborating uh, on. One has already started, and there are others which are target targeted at animals, which are susceptible, and what they are all can be in our particular environment here in Southern Africa. So when it comes to this testing of human specimen in veterinary laboratories, it doesn't happen in a vacuum. The OIE has actually set up a number of guidelines, 10 in total, which should be considered when you are looking at uh, collaborating, a collaboration between veterinary and the uh, public health laboratories. The first one is uh, regulatory affairs, which means that uh, in some instances it's recognized that the law may not permit such collaboration, but uh, there should be some circumventing regulations which can happen so that you know this takes place, so that the numbers can be ramped up in terms of testing. Business continuity, definitely it is a priority disease, so it should be accorded priority, but that does not mean that the veterinary laboratories should stop the testing of other animal samples. And then of course, you have to agree on the type of test beforehand and also the testing requirements. In terms of scalability, it is well recognized that veterinary laboratories are used to handling a lot more samples than their human colleagues, and that is why it is an advantage to have them on board. Then, of course, there are issues of quality assurance, which should be benchmarked against ISO 17025 or equivalent to make sure that what is being done there, people can have confidence in the results. Then issues of biosafety and biosecurity are also important as is data management and reporting. All the data, all the results must be reported into the public health system so that they are consolidated into one report. Then the personnel who are involved in the testing must be trained and also they should be proper isolation of the lab which is handling this testing so that only necessary people are able to go and interact there. So the question is, what is the importance of mobilizing all available lab resources for testing? In this graph, what I'm trying to portray to you is to show you the public service laboratories which are doing the COVID testing in South Africa and also the private service laboratories. So you need both of them. You don't only need one, you need both of them because you need to ramp up the numbers when it comes to testing. As we said, the more tests you do, then uh, the closer your model is approximated to what is actually happening on the ground. This graph just shows the provincial trends of the three most affected provinces in South Africa since we moved down to level three of the lockdown. In the beginning, the epicenter was in the Western Cape province, but Dr. that Jack, changed. Just to let you know that you have two more minutes, please. Thank you. Okay, let me move very quickly. That has changed now that uh, Hauteng is now the epicenter. But then what is in a peak and where is it going to lead us to? Let me just, you know, e e explain that using this graph here, the pandemic progression scenario. If we control the peak very, very nicely and carefully by observing everything, we are going to have a flattening of the curve very close to the bottom line here. But if we don't you know, control that very well, then that flattening will happen at a much higher level and it might even go up. And this difference can be due to a number of factors, including non-compliance. And at the very worst, then you are going to have several epidemics coming up. This was a flattening and then you have a second peak also showing up. 
So what are the lessons for Africa? I think as you saw from the first presentation, there's already evidence that the number of countries on the continent are experiencing a rise in COVID-19 cases. Those five top countries were already shown to you and the deaths as of last week uh, on, the, on Friday, it was 16,700. But the key point to note here is the reporting and there's a general acceptance that there's a lot of under-reporting that is taking place. So we may not be getting the correct picture. So the key is testing, testing, and testing. But in the absence of a vaccine, then we should revert to these behavioral changes, which have been well articulated. The wearing of face masks, hand washing or sanitizing, and social distancing. The problem is that we are having up to 40% asymptomatic transmission. It is a concern because people don't know they have the disease and they are transmitting it. And then the inadequate testing on the continent compared to our, our colleagues in other parts of the world. So let me try to conclude by saying most countries on the continent now may be experiencing a false calm before the storm. The storm will definitely come. As the WHO said, African countries must treat what is happening in South Africa as a precursor of what to expect in their countries soon, and they must plan accordingly. What is clear is that COVID-19 is not going anywhere soon, so we need to plan to contain this disease for some time yet to come. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Etel, over to you. Hello. Hello and good day to everybody. Um, my name is Ethel Chitsongo and I'm with AU Panvac and I'm going to share the presentation for AU Panvac now. Okay. Okay, uh, this is the outline of my presentation. I think I won't go through it. Um, for introduction, AU PANVAC provides international independent quality control for, of all veterinary vaccines produced and imported into Africa. We are situated in the National Veterinary Institute of Ethiopia uh, in a small town called Debrezate, just 40 kilometers from Addis Ababa. Um, PANVAC was established as a response to the rinderpest uh, rinderpest threat, which was killing a lot of animals. And when the Hi, so we can yes. see your slide. You can see the slides. Oh, sorry. So let me see because I put them on share. I don't understand. Okay. Did you see any slide? <laughs> Hello? No, we can't. Okay, let me see. Um, let me see. Oh, my laptop seems not to be responding very well. Uh, can you see my screen now? It says we have started sharing, but we, yeah, we can now. You can see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. So. Okay, so I'll start the slideshow from the beginning. It's only my, my laptop decided to lag. It's actually op it's opening. I don't know why it's doing that. Oh. 
let me remove my video can you see the screen up hello yes yes, yes. you can see the screen yes okay so i'm going to talk about the support um it, at least what au panvac is providing in terms of support and this is the outline i think i, I just talked over it and this is our introduction panvac is, situ is situated at the national veterinary institute in debris eight about 40 kilometers from addis ababa um, its establishment came as a result of rinderpest threats for which affected uh, mainly cattle in Africa. And it was, when it was found that the quality of the vaccines that were being used were not of good quality. So PANVAC was established as a project to oversee the quality control of the vaccines that were being used for the rinderpest campaign. And eventually the rinderpest was eradicated from Africa and its success led to the establishment of to the institutionalization of PANVAC as an institutionalization of PANVAC under the African Union Commission. Um, the mission for AU PANVAC is to promote the use of good quality vaccines and diagnostic reagents for the control and eradication of animal diseases in Africa. And to achieve these missions, AU PANVAC is um, many mandates, but the general mandates are the provision of quality control of all veterinary vaccines produced and imported into Africa, and also production of essential biological reagents for animal disease surveillance and control. And the specific mandates come as, as to, maintain the, uh, to maintain Africa free from rinderpest. Uh, we are the custodian of the rinderpest emergency preparedness vaccine stock and also we, we stock the rinderpest material for Africa. And also, we also work in the harmonization of vaccine registration for the African, uh, African producers, because generally you tend to find most of the vaccines that are used in Africa are actually from outside and most African labs cannot register their vaccines because they seem to miss a few things that are required for them to be able to register. So we are assisting the African labs in the harmonization of the vaccine registration. And the other thing is we collaborate with a lot of partners and different stakeholders in animal disease control and vaccine development. And as of late with the COVID-19, we are offering the COVID-19 testing support um, PANVAC, as it stands now, is an OIE collaborating center since 2013. It's a food and agriculture organization reference center since 2015, and is the FAO OIE rinderpest holding facility for Africa since May 2015. And it's also certified for ISO 9001 since February 2017, and also accredited for for test for PPR quality control for ISO 17025 since November 2018. So an introduction to COVID is there's nothing new that I would say about COVID, but basically the beginning of the 21st century has seen um, a lot of emergence, emergence of uh, new diseases which are, also, which are zoonotic in origin, and these are SARS, MERS, um, H5N1, we have a lot of them, and of late we have now COVID-19. And the zoonotic disease, according to the OIE manual, uh, just refers to disease or infection which is naturally transmissible from animals to humans. And most of these diseases that are giving us a lot of problems are actually in that group. But is this new, inf is this information new? Not at all, because according to the OIE, most of the human pathogens, 60% of human pathogens are zoonotic. And 75% of imaging, infe Im imaging infectious diseases of humans have an animal origins. And most of these are really fatal. Um, I think I skipped a slide. Let me see. So what do we know about zoonotic diseases? There is a lot of work that has been done for zoonotic diseases and a lot of hotspots have been identified. 
and also information on the on what factors precipitate the emergence of these diseases and especially the coronaviruses that have been known since the 1960s and it's only now the coronaviruses get, 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 got more widespread um, recognition since the, the coming of COVID-19. So in 2003, we had the SARS, which affected China and Hong Kong. And in the World Health Assembly resolution on 27 May 2013 recognized SARS as, um, as a potential. Um, is, is, is the first severe infectious disease in the 21st century, which was a serious threat to the stability and growth of the economies and the livelihoods of human populations. Um, and also in 2012, we have the mess which affected the Middle East, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, and Korea. And 2019, we have over 15 million affected 15 million people worldwide affected by the disease with a mortality rate of more than 4%. Then comes the One Health concept. With um, WHO, FAO, and OIE put forward a tripartite initiative for the control of zoonotic diseases, and the collaborative efforts uh, are meant to improve the the people's health and animals and also the environment. And the One Health concept is expected to be a pillar in mitigating against all zoonotic diseases. And because of that, the, with, with the devastation of the COVID-19, the OIE issued a, gui a guidance for animal health laboratories to support control efforts for the disease, which uh, I think the previous speaker had elaborated on. And in support of this, just to go over them, we have um, veterinary laboratories to provide support in quality assurance, biosafety, and biosecurity, high therapeutic testing for the surveillance and control of infectious diseases um, for COVID-19, and veterinary services to provide expertise in the fields of epidemiology, risk assessment, training, and risk communication. And what is the AU support to the continental effort? So with, with AU is um, a department, a, a, sorry, a, AU is, is under the Department of Rural Economy and Agriculture. And the Departments of Rural Economy and Agriculture and Social Affairs are collaborating in the implementation of COVID-19 testing for the staff of AUC and also the AU member states embassies. Um, and the Medical Service Directorate and PANVAC are working together in the actualization of the testing. And so far, PCR reagents for testing um, the samples were received and also PPE were received from the Africa CDC to initiate the testing. And as we stand now, um, the Medical Service Directorate through the leadership of Dr. Naftal Kilenga have also uh, procured, is in the process of procuring um, kits, consumables and kits worth 30,000 US dollars and also personal protective equipment. While all the reagents and materials and equipment were provided by PANVAC and also of course the testing facility of which the testing is being done at AU PANVAC. So based on the OIE guidelines, AU PANVAC currently provides real-time PCR testing for COVID-19, uh, is preparing hand sanitizers which is for protection, uh, which are required for daily protection, is involved in in development of vaccine, in development of vaccines, drugs, and diagnostic reagents against COVID-19. And this is done in collaboration with partners. And currently, it's partnering with the Ministry of Innovation of Ethiopia and also the Addis Ababa University. And also, they are looking at accumulating isolates for this for sequencing and vaccine development. Um, the testing of COVID-19 samples at PANVAC. Uh, PANVAC, since it's supporting the medical health services, does not deal with the samples directly. Requests for testing and sample collection is actually carried out by the medical services directorate. These samples are then transported to AU PANVAC. At AU PANVAC, we have a biosafety level three laboratory where the extraction of the samples is carried out. 
And from there, this, the RNA is carried to molecular biology lab where the um, real-time PCR is processed. And results are then compiled and forwarded to the MSD for reporting. No reporting is done at AU Panvac and no patients are dealt with at AU Panvac. And as of today, we have, um, yeah, as of Friday, we've actually tested 474 samples, and that was our seventh week of, of testing. And according to this graph, you can see we, we had 4% uh, of those positive. And based on AU Panvax expertise in veterinary vaccine quality control, uh, AU Panvax. Hi, Ms. Etel, please just yes. to let you know you have two minutes left. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I think I'm almost done. Anyway, thank you. Um, based on AU Panvax expertise in vaccine quality control, you are looking at development and use of vaccines in animal in animals and humans. You're looking at cooperation in terms of development and use of, of vaccines in animals and humans and establishing platforms, platforms to optimize vaccine development, capacitate laboratories to carry out research on the development of vaccines, diagnostic reagents and therapeutics, um, and also work on vaccines against COVID-19. Vaccines against COVID-19 must be quality certified and be approved for use by relevant authorities. Data on vaccine development against COVID-19 must be peer reviewed and published and also assessment of the vaccines should be done globally. So in conclusion, COVID-19 is a wake up call for governments to consider the establishment of multi-agencies and multidisciplinary task force to ensure shared objectives, clear roles, effective information sharing, close collaboration with AU technical offices responsible for animal, human, environmental and plant health, the COVID-19 crisis is a clear indication of the interconnectedness of humans, animals, and their shared environment. A multidisciplinary collaborative approach is required to minimize the impact of this rapidly spreading virus. And AU Panvac is available to support all AU member states with laboratory capacity for COVID-19 testing and vaccine quality control. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Noma, over to you. Okay, good afternoon. Um, while uh, the, um, the previous speaker stopped sharing her screen, um, just to introduce myself, my name is Nomatemba Mklanga. I hope you can all hear me well. I will also show my video just uh, for a few minutes um, and then I'll start sharing my, my screen. Uh, my presentation is on the impacts of um, COVID-19 on agriculture, food and nutrition security. So um, I hope you can see the screen now. Yes, yes. Okay. So um, can I stop sharing the video? Stop video, yes. Okay, so um, just um, as our previous speakers have said, this uh, pandemic continues to evolve. And uh, therefore, I will not in this presentation pretend to have the, um, to have assessed the full impacts on, of COVID-19 and its containment measures on food and nutrition security as the situation is continuing to evolve, particularly uh, in the continent of Africa. However, what is clear is that uh, definitely it has set back um, gains that have been achieved towards the attainment of the Sustainable Development Goal number two on ending hunger. And um, just to quote a recent um, report, which is, um, uh, the latest edition of the State of Food Security and Nutrition in the World, uh, popularly known as SOFI. Um, this was launched on the 13th of July, so two weeks ago. Uh, what SOFI does is that it acknowledges that while the situation continues to evolve, this uh, pandemic will uh, likely um, impact the food security and nutrition status of the most vulnerable population groups. And uh, what you see on the screen is a direct quote from, from that report, which um, I encourage all of you to read if you're interested in this topic. And um, the, who are these vulnerable people? So for us, um, looking at our constitu uh, constituents here, we're talking about the smallholder farmers and their families. We are also looking at casual workers, and this is in all sectors. Um, and those living in commodity and tourism dependent economies. 
So these are the most vulnerable in our community, in our society that are likely to be impacted further by this COVID-19. As you are aware, most people have had, have lost their jobs and some uh, have um, lost uh, other employment opportunities that they usually get during this types or this time of um, uh, farming. Um, so this report globally estimates that while, um, as I said, it is still early to say, but roughly around 83 million up to 132 million people will go hungry in 2020 as a result of this, uh, the economic recession resulting from the impacts of COVID-19. And uh, the continent of Africa is in a very fragile context already. Uh, this report shows that an alarming 250 million people are undernourished. And sadly, our continent has the highest prevalence of undernourishment, which is the measure of hunger that is used in this report. And up to 675 million people are food insecure. These are figures that are really, really unfortunate given that we are trying to attain the SDG goals. And what COVID-19 is doing is further compromising this food security and nutrition situation. And Africa is particularly vulnerable because of its uh, dependency on imports, both for you know, food, that uh, is the, the food that we eat, as well as the inputs that we use for producing our foods. So most countries uh, rely on these uh, imports. And when uh, countries uh, introduced the restrictions at the beginning, we saw a lot of impact as the export restrictions or hurdles in transportation occurred. And therefore, this has led to a reduction in the amount of food that is available. Um, I see some text, but I cannot read because I'm in uh, the screen. So if there's anything that uh, needs to be communicated, please send somebody or let me. Uh, this said, um, in addition, as um, there have been a number of um, containment measures imposed by countries to restrict the spread of the disease. And as previous speakers have uh, mentioned, these are necessary to ensure that um, you know, there's no loss of life. But these have had disruptions in the value chains and in access to uh, food by an, a number of uh, people. Uh, in, although, I mean, in a number of countries, these restrictions are being lifted, uh, whether uh, too early as uh, Dr. Lumba said, I, you know, I, I don't know, we are yet to see. And then also, what is, um, also unfortunate in, uh, on our continent is that we've always had uh, less uh, access to social protection uh, measures. So it is estimated that Africa uh, safety net programs cover only 10% of the population of the continent. And therefore with what has happened with COVID-19, it means many people are in need of this um, food assistance which they, our governments are not able to provide. Therefore, further bringing other people who would otherwise be able to fend for themselves into a precarious uh, situation. And since this is a global pandemic, we are not only talking about the impacts that are happening within the continent, but other uh, areas of the world as well. And as we know, we have in many countries, a number of um, people in the diaspora that support uh, their families in the continent and due to this economic recession that has led to reductions in remittances and therefore further reducing the purchasing power of, um, um, of the people in the continent. And um, on top of that, uh, COVID-19 comes at a time when our continent is suffering from other threats to food security and nutrition. I'm talking about climate-related shocks, such as droughts, floods. Uh, we had earlier on uh, mention of fall armyworm, desert locusts, particularly in the Horn of Africa and the Sahel region. We have ongoing conflicts, which are all compromising the food security situation of the population. That said, um, I'll go to directly to how COVID-19 is affecting agriculture and food security. 
from what we, the work that we've done at FAO, we see that um, they are may, it uh, affects food security through both direct effects and indirect effects. Direct effects mainly by impacting the health of those that are involved in the food production and supply, as well as affecting uh, the availability of uh, labor to agriculture, as well as um, uh, other segments of the value chains. And then indirectly through disruption in transport, therefore affecting the logistics, um, as well as the remittances, as I have um, mentioned earlier on, thereby reducing incomes and the ability, uh, the purchasing power of people to be able to afford healthy and nutritious food, leading to food insecurity and compromised nutrition. What I'll do is, um, in the interest of time, I've summarized the impact at three levels. I'll look at impacts at the farm level, which are affecting agricultural productivity, impacts along the agricultural value chains, which are resulting in post-harvest losses and the slowing of distribution and marketing of goods, as well as impact at household level, which is mainly um, due to the soaring unemployment rates, um, uh, income losses, and rising food costs across rural and urban areas. So uh, going straight to farm level impacts, what we've observed are disruptions in input supply, labor availability, and extension services. So while um, most countries have had exemptions to, to uh, what they call essential services and classified food and agriculture activities as part of those essential services, there have been delays in farmers getting access to agricultural inputs due to um, restrictions of movement from one place to the, to the other. And this has impacted mainly the landlocked countries and those that are import dependent. We've also seen uh, farm labor shortages, particularly casual labor involved in high value chains, such as horticultural production. Uh, and again, because of the measures, containing measures that prevent gathering of large groups of people. Uh, pastoralists, particularly for Eastern Africa, where they are dominant and in the Sahel, they have had uh, also, they've been impacted in terms of access to grazing and watering points because the restrictions have made that there's controlled movement of human beings to avoid the spread of the disease. And then we've also seen a reduction in um, extension and advisory services, although lately, there have been uh, uh, innovations for using digital solutions to try and address this problem. And uh, fortunately for Eastern Africa, exceptions have been granted for desert locust control. Moving on, uh, impacts along the value chain. Here I'm just going to focus on the disruptions that have been noted in logistics as well as processing and market access. We've seen particularly in um, in East Africa, delays in the movement of goods due to control at borders. Uh, the truck drivers have been um, identified as one of the um, key group that if uh, not controlled could spread the disease across countries. And as such, COVID-19 testing has been required for them. At the beginning, as we all know, we didn't have rapid tests and as such, we had lots of um, goods uh, being at border, stuck at, at, at uh, borders for a number of days. And that has also led to uh, losses, food losses and waste, particularly for perishable goods such as uh, fish and horticultural produce. Uh, social distancing measures um, led to initially the closure of many pack houses and processing plants because as this is a new, a relatively new pandemic, there were still protocols being developed to ensure that uh, these processing plants can operate safely. Uh, most of them have metal uh, surfaces that um, could easily be um, transmitting the disease. So social distancing has really affected 
them. And um, as we know, most women are, in, are employed in these value chains and as such have been highly affected. In uh, urban areas, uh, most people rely on selling their wares through the open markets. And these were some of the, uh, of the outlets that were closed, leading to loss of income opportunities for a number of people. And then as we are also aware, hotels and restaurants are among the targeted um, environments for closure to, uh, to limit the spread of the disease. And this affected the marketing of fresh produce uh, and including the collapse of fish supply chains. A case in point is, for instance, in Uganda, when the uh, lockdown measures were initially introduced. Um, now, at the household level, as I, men as I mentioned earlier on, this is really related to reduction in employment and income opportunities and access to nutritious food. Many people have lost their jobs and incomes and therefore have limited purchasing power to afford healthy foods. The closure of local and farmers markets have limited access to diverse and healthy and nutritious foods such as fresh vegetables and um, uh, fruits and vegetables because what happened at the beginning is that people now uh, prefer to buy foods in bulk and most perishable foods cannot be bought in bulk and also the closure of these markets has led to some people who have limited income from accessing their daily source of nutritious food. Uh, as we are aware, most countries have closed schools. Hi, Norma. Just to let you know, you have two more minutes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, the closure of schools meant that um, uh, these uh, children, uh, a number of children have no access to school fielding programs that they were relying on for nutritious foods. And as I've mentioned, uh, remittances flows have declined significantly and also uh, reducing income and uh, for people relying on these sources of income. Uh, just to quickly to move on to the response measures, we've seen a number of response measures to mitigate the impacts of COVID-19. The, the, the short-term measures were mainly expanding the uh, food assistance program to include those that were not necessarily initially covered under this uh, food safety nets program and providing uh, productive enhancing safety nets such as uh, cash plus seeds and livestock stock. We've, uh, we've seen innovation in terms of use of digital uh, solutions and exemptions as I mentioned earlier on, as well as a number of uh, impact studies have been done to try and identify key intervention areas. Moving on to the now looking at the medium and long term um, measures, uh, what FAO is advocating for is uh, for countries to contain, uh, to continue to maintain open borders, but of course with disease containment measures to ensure minimal delays and also limit the spread of the disease. We are promoting food, uh, short food supply chains um, and encouraging the World One Health approach, which has been uh, mentioned by uh, previous speakers. And uh, here uh, to emphasize that this requires coordination among different line ministries, education, agriculture, trade, etc. And this will this approach will help us deal with future uh, pandemics uh, or shocks, as has been mentioned by other speakers, that this is a common phenomenon. And we are also advocating for creating an enabling environment to enhance the role of the private sector in uh, food systems. And I'll, I'll end by um, really drawing to your attention to FAO's call for new and reinforced partnership, because in line with um, this coordinated approach, also in terms of the response, there is need for partners to come together to address the full impacts of COVID-19. And this, um, I've, I've, I've left a link where you can see the areas, the key areas, the seven key priority areas that have been identified. And I'll post on the chat box the dialogue, the virtual dialogue that FAO is organizing next week to look specifically for Africa priorities. Um, thank you very much. I will not go through this slide because it just shows the, the link between COVID-19, animal and human health, which other colleagues have covered extensively. And I've posted also here links to, um, to uh, 
briefs where you can find comprehensive information on this topic. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's been such an interesting session. Um, I have been able to learn quite a lot from colleagues online. Um, we have quite a number of questions. Um, we will take um, a few of them in the interest of time, but my panelists and experts on the line will go into the Q&A chat box and answer some of your questions. I will encourage you to put your questions in the Q&A chat box because it will be easier for me to work through. But however, I will also have a look at the chat um, box to see what questions we have. So very quickly, I think I will start with Dr. Mulumba. Um, this question is directed to you. It says, um, gleaning from the South Africa experience and maybe other countries' experiences, are there robust decisions to support tools available for government to use in deciding the severity of the lockdowns? So I will encourage my um, panelists to answer very briefly so that we can take um, a quick round of another question. Over to you, Dr. Mulumba. Thank you very much, Wande, for that question. I think the one thing that we should all realize is we are all in uncharted territory. So we are learning as we go, and that is why it becomes extremely important to document what we are passing through, so that others who haven't passed through that can actually learn from what we are saying. So from the outset, I cannot say that there's any one single country which had, you know, decision tools which were tailored to the SARS-CoV-2 infection. But right now, when we look at what has been happening in other countries, relative to what is happening in our countries, we should be able to build up what works for us. And that might not necessarily be what works for another country. So it becomes very important that we avoid extrapolation because we might mislead ourselves. Thank you. Thank you very much. Fantastic answer. So I will throw the next question to Etel from AU Pandak. Um, this question really says, do you envisage PANVAC being involved in the QC of COVID vaccines on the continent if and when the vaccine becomes available? Over to you. Yes, I think according to what we have discussed at PANVAC, it is very possible for us to do the work, to do the vaccine quality control because it's not very different from anything else that we are currently working on. And we also have the capacity to even work with animals, at least in a biosafety level three lab. Thank you very much. You. So this is for you, um, Noma. He says, how can Africa balance between the um, public health consequence of a pandemic and the economic and food security? So over to you, Noma. Uh, thank you very much for that question. Um, so this is a delicate balance indeed. Uh, and I think um, I've alluded in the last slides to some of the measures that can be taken. So in the, in the interim, in the short term, there is need for, to provide support to those members of society that are falling into this food insecurity situation by providing uh, food safety nets. This has been done in a number of countries through providing food parcels. Um, etc., or cash, cash transfers. But in the long term, uh, balancing this uh, public health versus food security situation really requires more of a nuanced dialogue between the different line ministries. And as I said, it requires that we, we maintain open borders because there is need for food. If food is an essential commodity and therefore it needs to move across countries, uh, within countries, and therefore that there is need to see how that can be done in a safe way. And already they are, you know, promising um, practices which include, you know, these rapid tests and in some cases ensuring that the drivers that go to a particular border then get uh, changed over and the others take over. So there are many uh, I would say there are many um, ways to, to address this. I'll type in the chat box a link to the, um, the FAO call for partnership, which really gives a more comprehensive response to, to this balance. Thank you. 
Over to you. Thank you so much, Norma. That's really fantastic. I'll take a comment, which is not a question, but I think it's worth um, reading out. Um, just kudos. Um, this is to AU Panvac. It's great to hear the extraordinary work of the AU Panvac in actualizing the One Health concept. This is a real witness that veterinary labs can play a pivotal role in combating zoonotic diseases. So I think. Um, it's good to see the African Union um, take a leadership in terms of um, advocating and actually practicing um, what we see as and what we expect One Health to be. Um, I'm really proud of our um, colleagues at AU Panvac and other colleagues in AIBA and of course the Africa CDC in the leadership activities that we are providing in terms of the um, advocacy for One Health. So Yuma, I'm going to throw this question to you. I know that you have taken it a bit, but um, our other colleagues may not be able to see the uh, answers that you have given on this. So it says, is there any joint outbreak investigation in Africa for COVID-19 patients with closed animal um, and follow up with animal testing? Um, as Is there any news on such activities for investigation of animal status? So um, Yuma, um, if you want to take that question, um, then I may be able to chip in a bit. Okay, thank you, Andy. Uh... Yeah, as I, I have tried to briefly indicate, in countries like Sierra Leone and Liberia, there are uh, joint outbreak investigations, in other words, animal health workers and other, for instance, surveillance and so on, so on, officers from the animal sector, after receiving proper training, have been involved with, you know, in uh, contact tracing, uh, outbreak investigation for COVID specifically. Uh, at this stage, information are limited from other countries, uh, but I think there are a lot of COVID-related activities jointly undertaking. We, uh, the National One Health Platform, because of the restrictions, meetings, and so on, so on, perhaps may not be fully active at this stage, but otherwise, you know, uh, most of these things uh, have a kind of potential for joint venture. Uh, the other thing is really related to the surveillance, I think, is about in, animal, in animals for COVID. Uh, I am not aware of uh, an undertaking at this stage, but discussions are underway to investigate uh, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, presence of this virus in animals and also potential role that these animals can play, uh, may play in the epidemiology of this virus in the future. So research universities and also uh, animal health sectors, uh, some uh, FAO colleagues are, you know, uh, very much interested in launching this type of activities in the near future. Over to you. Um, great. <laughs> so we are really having an interesting discussion. Um, a few more questions, a round of questions. Um, so this question is to you, Norma. It says that um, some co countries in Africa are enjoying the rainy seasons. Um, it's critical for routine farming. I'm just wondering how much support is FAO providing to agricultural sectors of countries by way of ensuring food production is not interrupted um, from COVID-19. Over to you, Noma. Thank you, very, very interesting question. So actually, um, I had to leave an FAO AUC meeting, uh, which is taking place uh, this afternoon as well. And we are coordinating with ministers of agriculture to ensure that the agricultural season is not compromised. And the way FAO is practically um, addressing this issue is ensuring that we are facilitating movements of, of uh, agriculture inputs, be it for crop production, fisheries, uh, livestock, etc., to make sure that these are not compromised. And then two, we are advocating together with ministries. Um, we, in this meeting, we in, invited the ministries of trade to also see how the movement can be uh, enabled. And, uh, and now we are also um, you know, innovating and making sure that extension services can be provided digitally. So I'll just mention those few, but if you really want a comprehensive um, response, again, we have a whole website where you can see how FAO is responding we are at the forefront of ensuring that the food, the, this COVID-19 pandemic 
does not become a food security crisis. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much um, for that answer. There are a few questions that have been directed to Africa CDC. So if I may, I will take some of them. Um, so one of the questions is that can Africa CDC assist individual farmers with farm inputs to help um, provide enough food to minimize food shortages in various places on the continent? Um, just to say that the Africa CDC cannot assist farmers because um, working in agriculture is not within our mandate. However, we do have colleagues, um, an African Union Technical Institution, AUIBA, um, that's the Africa Union Inter Africa Bureau of Animal Resources, um, which is situated in Nairobi and works very closely with Norma and our colleagues, the FAO colleagues, um, in supporting agriculture. So I believe that my colleagues in AIBA um, will be joining us um, for subsequent webinars um, and will be sharing some of the work that they are doing. We will be best placed to work with individual farmers to support um, um, food sh shortages across the continent. Another question that I feel is posed to something um, the question is the question posed to us looks around healthcare worker infection so i think one of the things that um, the question says is um, over 12000 health workers have contacted covid-19 what measures are being put in place to curtail infection at um, um, health facilities. So just to say that on our part, we are supporting member states with provision of um, PPE. Um, we are actively training um, health workers across the continent. And so far, we have been able to train over 5,000 over 5,000 health workers across the continent. Um, similarly, um, country government of guidelines. So next question, I think I will throw to um, my colleague, Yuma. He says that how many veterinary sector agents are involved in surveillance? Is this at the national level or district or community level? So Yuma, um, I know that the work you had been doing um, with FAO, you might be able to provide us with some useful information on that. Over to you, Yuma. So I think you are referring with COVID surveillance, no? Uh, some, whoever is asking this question, I think. Pato, so if it is related to COVID, as I've told you, we have very limited information. Uh, in some countries that are involved, they received the, the veterinary sector, so in other words, veterinary personnel, whether it is a community animals worker, or surveillance or other uh, what they call, they call them officers have been receiving training and involved in what is unfolding that specific country and this is done at a national and sub-national level in other words also at a community level for instance in sierra leone and liberia over to you wendy Okay, fantastic. So um, I think we are just about to wrap up um, most of the questions. Um, just to add on to the question around assisting individual farmers, um, the, the Africa Union Department of Rural Economy and Agriculture, DREA, um, is actively working with our countries to support on agriculture. Again, going back to what Noma said about the um, FAO um, AU conversations and activities and some of the meetings that we have been putting together um, to support countries. So the Africa Union Commission and um, similarly the FAO have been working hard to ensure that um, we address issues around food security and re reduce and minimize the impact on food shortages across the continent. Um, so before I give my panelists um, the final um, the floor to say a few last words, um, there's another question for Africa CDC and Africa Union saying that 
does Africa Union and Africa CDC take an active role in PPE procurement to ensure that all countries um, get an acceptable amount required? In fact, yes, we recently launched a procurement platform um, to ensure that all of our 55 member states have access to good quality PPE laboratory um, test kits and any supplies needed for COVID-19 response. Um, so member states have, um, we have developed a pool procurement platform and member states can actively go on that site and procure the necessary amounts needed for the member states. So um, what we have tried to do is ensure that there's enough supply to come to the continent and member states have access to good quality um, um, product. Um, so we recently launched our website. I will just drop that in the chat. So very quickly, I will just give the floor to my colleagues. Um, if they would just like to say um, a few last things, um, we will start from um, Mishak, um, move to Etel, then Noma, then we will wrap up the session. So over to you, Mishak, very briefly, um, one minute <laughs> wrap up. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wande. I think what I would like to say is uh, the rest of the continent should not bask in the false confidence that uh, they have had you know, COVID-19 under control. As has been indicated by the WHO, this is a law before the storm. And we should take advantage of this period to actually not only prepare for what is coming, but also to draw lessons from those who have passed through this situation. Thank you. Thank you, Etel, over to you. Okay, um, I think what I just want to reiterate is that the veterinary institutions, I have a lot of capacity that can actually be used in this COVID-19 outbreak, because sometimes people don't know what they have within their backyards, but most of them, they can be able to handle a lot of the work so that the situation can actually at least we can mitigate the COVID-19 in a better way or faster. That's it, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so over to you, Noma. Uh, thank you very much for an interesting session. I've learned a lot also here. And I would really encourage those that are participating to um, participate in our virtual dialogue next week, Monday on uh, discussing the priorities for agriculture. Uh, since all of us are one way or the other impacted by um, food security issues, it would be good to hear your views. Please do participate. I've shared the link on how you can register and participate. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Yuma and Malian. Um, in four minutes, if you can just say your thanks and wrap up. Uh, so thank you. As Etel indicated, uh, uh, I just provided just a few examples of uh, One Health in Action. And uh, there are non enormous investments made during the, the emerging pandemic threat programs that was implemented in many parts of Africa by through the FAO projects. I think those capacities need to be put into good use, but it depends upon uh, the national capacity and the interest you know, to involve this, uh, this partners. Uh, as we get more information, I uh, promise to provide a more comprehensive picture of this one else activities in Africa, both in terms of COVID testing and also the functions of uh, one else platforms in the continent. And I'd like to thank one day and uh, uh, Stephanie for a very well organized uh, webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Malian. Um, anything to add on? Okay, thank you all. Thanks for listening. And uh, as Dr. Mlumba said, this is a wake up point for Africa that we are able to learn from the countries that have gone through this, that we pick a leaf and we are able to prepare for what is coming next. Thank you all. Also, I saw people were asking about the presentations. Yes, they will be shared to you. Also, the recorded session will be available on the Africa CDC website. Thank you all for your participation. So thank you very much. I'd like to say thank you to um, my esteemed um, 
um, panelists, thank you for joining me on this session. It was a great, insightful session. So on behalf of um, Director of Africa CDC, Dr. John Ingengerson, I'd like to thank our participants from various member states from outside of the AU member states. I see people from um, Pakistan, India joining us. We say thank you for taking time to join us. And we hope that this session was valuable to you. Um, next month, end of um, August, we will be having the, um, the third session. Um, hopefully, we, you would join us and you have more people from your institutions, um, from your networks join us. So um, thank you very much for joining us. And I would like to say thank you very much to Peter, who is our interpreter, um, who is ensuring that we have this session in English and French. Thank you very much, Peter. And thank you very much um, to my colleague, Ido Wu, um, who has really done a great work in the back end of this. So on behalf of um, our team, the 1L team here in Africa CDC, I say thank you very much, and I look forward to speaking to you next month. So thank you very much, and goodbye. Bye. <laughs>